the topic on which I'd like to speak is neoliberalism and neo-fascism. Now, there are all over the world, there is now an upsurge of fascistic movements. And as Comrade Sitaram pointed out, in the recent European Union elections, they have made significant gains. Now, these movements are not called fascist by the liberal press. All liberal opinion is characterized by the fact that, number one, it does not call these movements fascist. And number two, it, it calls them nationalist, extreme nationalist, populist, right-wing populist, and so on, but never the term fascist. And secondly, it always attributes political reasons for the emergence of these fascist movements. This is something which you find even in our country. The emergence of Modi is attributed to um, the demolition of the Babri Masjid, uh, the emergence of the BJP as a major political force because of the uh, Advani's Rath Yatra and so on. I'm not saying those are wrong, but it never gets to the core of why such movements are emerging all over the world. In Italy, Meloni, who is a legacy of Italian fascism, is now actually has formed a government. In Germany, and Germany, the AFD, Alternatives for Germany, is now the second most powerful political force in that country. Now, similarly, in the US, Trump is again emerging, having been in power and having been dislodged from power, is again emerging as the front-ranking contender for power in the United States. All over the world, this is not just therefore confined to Modi. It is not confined to India. It is not confined. In Turkey, for instance, you have Edwan, who is again a very similar kind of character emerging to prominence. So it is a phenomenon which is a global phenomenon. And if it's a global phenomenon, then its explanation cannot lie in the individual political developments of a particular country. Though, of course, these political developments are important to show how far this movement goes. But on the other hand, there must be something more basic that underlies all this. The fact that this is something which is not called fascist is really quite amazing. Because almost every feature of fascism which we have noticed in the 1930s is present in most of these movements in varying degrees. What are these features? First, the singling out of some hapless minority group, whether it is Muslims, whether it is immigrants, whether it is some blacks, whether it is some ethnic minority. So the singling out of a hapless minority group as the object of hatred to be attacked against whom the majority is mobilized, a very fundamental feature of fascism. Second, it has of course, it is a repressive authoritarian state. Third, it's a repressive authoritarian state that does not only use state power. There is a fundamental difference between authoritarianism and fascism. Authoritarianism uses only state power, while fascism, while using state repression, also uses repression by fascist street thugs like ABVP, for instance. Now, all over, you find teachers being humiliated. You find ABVP militants barging into people's houses in order to humiliate them. So you have a combination of street thuggery together with state repression, very important feature of fascism. Fourthly, of course, very close relationship 
of monopoly capital with fascist elements. And finally, the emergence of a tremendous personality cult, which we have seen in our own country. As a matter of fact, Indian fascism is the closest you find, which actually shows all the classical symptoms of fascism to what had prevailed in the 1930s. It is something which Hitler had talked about a 1000 year Reich. And here you have Modi talking about a 1000 year Hindu, uh, you know, Raj. You similarly find that everywhere in the 1930s, fascism was characterized not just by proximity to monopoly capital, but to a new segment of monopoly capital. In Germany, this was associated with Krupps and so on who are associated with armaments, steel, producers, goods. That was the segment with which the fascists were most closely associated. While the earlier monopoly capital confined to industries like textiles and so on, while it was a beneficiary of fascist rule, did not have such a close relationship. In Japan, you had the Zaibatsu, the old Zaibatsu monopoly capital, but of course there was a new segment of monopoly capital that was called the Shinko Zaibatsu, like Nissan and so on, which actually had very close relationships with the emerging military fascist regime. Now, similarly in India, it is not just the old monopoly capital, but the new elements of monopoly capital, we all know about it, people have been talking all morning about it, who are the closest to the Indian fascist elements. Now the question is, why is it that we have this worldwide emergence of fascism at this particular juncture? Fascist elements are there in all modern societies. You, you have, but they are always there as fringe elements. They come center stage only when they get the support, both the media support as well as the financial support of particularly the new elements of monopoly capital, but generally of the monopolies. Now, why do the monopolies at particular conjunctures pro decide to provide support to these fringe elements to bring them center stage? That is precisely when capitalism, which is under the aegis of monopoly capital, undergoes a period of crisis. 1930s was one such. 1930s was a period in which there was a Great Depression and in the Great Depression, there was a mass increase in unemployment. And of course, in the context of that unemployment, monopoly capital, in order to prevent a challenge to its hegemony, makes common cause with the fascist elements. In fact, the Polish economist, Marxist economist Mikhail Kalecki, referred to fascism of the 1930s as a partnership between big business and the fascist upstarts. Now exactly a similar situation is what prevails in the world today. You have a situation of crisis of neoliberal capitalism. And that is why you have neo-fascism. I call it neo-fascism for reasons which I'll explain later. Neo-fascism emerges in a period of crisis of neoliberal capitalism. The entire liberal discourse that focuses only on the political elements, political attributes of fascism, wants to dissociate the link between neoliberalism and neo-fascism in order to show that neoliberalism is all right. It is fascism which is bad. As a matter of fact, what I want to argue, and I believe this is the position which follows from Dimitrov's analysis of fascism at the 7th Congress of the Comintern, that basically it is in a period of crisis that you have fascism, which Dimitrov defined as the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary elements of finance capital. Now, the fact that neoliberalism has got into a crisis is quite well known. In fact, if you look after the collapse of the US housing boom, 
if you look at the decadal growth rates of the world economy after the second world war the lowest decadal growth rate of the world economy was in the period in the decade up to 2019 and therefore it's very clear that there is much hi much higher levels of unemployment in the world today and of course a general slowing down of the growth rate now this is something which is not very surprising because it arises because of the extreme inequality which is generated under neoliberalism under neoliberalism what you find is that the wages don't rise even in the advanced countries now the wages get linked to the wages in the third world where there are huge labor reserves and the trade union movement gets weakened because capital monopoly capital american capital would tell the american trade unions all right you want to go on a strike then we are going to shift our plant to indonesia so the fact that capital is mobile actually allows capital to pit the workers of one country against the workers of the other and therefore the huge third world labor reserves act as a damper on the rise in the real wages even in the advanced countries joseph stiglitz made an uh, calculation you know the nobel prize winning economist according to which the real wage of a male average male american worker in 2011 was no higher than in 1968 it was if anything marginally lower now that just shows you the kind of stagnation in the level of wages that has come about of late but productivity is increasing everywhere if labor productivity rises sharply while real wages don't then the share of economic surplus within every country and taking the world as a whole of course increases and every such shift from wages to surplus means a reduction in the level of aggregate demand because a larger proportion almost the entire wage or working people's incomes is consumed while when it comes to the surplus only a fraction of it is consumed the rest of it is what is called saved therefore every such inequality increase is one which is associated with a tendency towards overproduction under capitalism this tendency may be kept in check because of the various asset price booms which occurred in the united states first you have a dot com bubble which means the equity prices of dot com companies went up therefore people felt they had become richer and there was a a, a splurge of consumption arising from that and when the dot com bubble was started collapsing then alan greenspan who was then the us uh, head of the federal reserve he actually stimulated another bubble which was the housing bubble that kept the us economy and the world economy going for a while all these bubbles what they do is to artificially raise the prices of particular assets because of which people who own these assets feel wealthier and of course start consuming a lot more than they otherwise would have done after the collapse of the housing bubble no similar bubble has taken place despite the fact that in the us economy the interest rate was lowered to virtually zero short and long term interest rates were lowered to virtually zero but nonetheless no similar bubble has taken place and that is something which I, because people learned they 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 learned that they thought they were wealthy but as a matter of fact with the collapse of the bubble then that illusion disappears and therefore they are much more careful in speculating subsequently therefore bubbles are not something which can be made to order because of which you have a situation where the world economy has virtually moved into a phase of stagnation now in this phase of stagnation naturally there is a threat to the hegemony of international finance capital naturally people would then like to say all right you know then then you know so much unemployment there's a collapse of the welfare state system let us revive 
the welfare state system. Let us, in fact, generate employment through enlarging the level of aggregate demand through state expenditure. And therefore, this is a phenomenon which monopoly capital wishes to avoid. Any threat to the neoliberal order, any threat to the hegemony of international finance capital, which can arise in a situation like this, which need not immediately even be a socialist threat. Many people argue that, look, there is hardly any socialist. I mean, you know, there are so few socialist countries now. All right, in the 1930s, there was the Soviet Union. Now there is no such threat to the dominance of capitalism. So why should they resort to fascism? I don't think it's the question of the threat from a socialist countries, from the socialist world, but it is a threat of people's uprising, demanding a change in policy, which cannot be accommodated within the neoliberal order, and therefore demanding a change in the neoliberal order, and therefore demanding a change in the hegemony of international finance capital, which is what they are worried about. And that is where they form an alliance with neo-fascism, first to change the discourse, because obviously any such alliance with neo-fascism would mean that the issue is no longer, or the issue that, that occupies people's minds is no longer employment or inflation or people's material conditions of life, but hating the Jew, hating the Muslim, hating the black or hating the immigrants and so on. So the change of discourse. And of course, every such inculcation of hatred divides the working class, divides the potential challenge to the hegemony of international finance capital. Now, this is where there's a big difference between classical fascism and what I call neo-fascism, which is why I call it neo-fascism. I'm, I'm not the originator of the term. This is very commonly used now. The reason is the following. Classical fascism, having come to power, had actually increased employment. Japan was the first country where the military fascist regime had overcome the Great Depression. And in fact, Japan had reached full employment. Germany was a country which, after Hitler's coming to power, actually moved to full employment. And they did so by increasing military expenditure and doing so by government borrowing. And this is something which, therefore, was possible because of the existence of fascist regimes, and this is something which also meant that if you spend all that on military uh, machine, perfecting your military machine, then it's inevitably something that which leads to wars. Uh, therefore, that fascism had managed to solve the economic crisis by a particular method, which was through militarization. At the same time, there was an alternative method which was tried in America under the New Deal by President Roosevelt, which really tried to increase government spending, but not necessarily military spending, building roads, building, uh, you know, welfare facilities and so on and so forth. But the problem is that the New Deal was immediately objected to by American monopoly capital and therefore it was withdrawn almost as soon as it had been introduced so that in 1937 there was another crisis in the United States and finally the liberal capitalist world came out of the Great Depression only under the impact of the Second World War. So the point is that classical fascism had the advantage that it actually overcame a certain crisis because of which there was a period between, say in Germany, between 1933 when uh, full employment was established and 1939 before the horrors of the war really struck the people when the fascists actually acquired a certain popularity that they had actually got rid of the Great Depression. But contemporary fascism is not really in a position to do that. And the reason is the following. 
if the government is to increase the level of aggregate demand it can do so by financing its expenditures either through a fiscal deficit which means you are spending let us say 100 rupees but you are not taxing anybody anything so the other people's income private incomes remain the same private spending remains the same but you are adding so that is why you can add to aggregate demand by state action if state expenditure is financed by a fiscal deficit alternatively if state expenditure is financed by taxing the capitalists or taxing the rich who save a part of their income then the state spends 100 rupees takes 100 rupees from the capitalists whose consumption was not 100 rupees whose consumption was only about 50 rupees therefore there is a net increase in aggregate demand of 50 but if the state spends by taxing the working people who in any case consume the bulk of their income then there's no net increase in aggregate demand there's only a, a a reduction in working people's demand and an increase in state demand no net increase in demand therefore the only two ways in which state expenditure can add to aggregate demand is if the state expenditure is financed either by a fiscal deficit or by taxing the capitalists and taxing the rich generally both these are objected to by finance capital they are objected to always by finance capital but now in particular since we have nation states but we have international finance capital any nation state that does not listen to the dictates of finance capital finance leaves that nation state under the neoliberal regime under neoliberal regime there will be a capital flight therefore you have a situation where both the ways in which the state can act in order to increase aggregate demand are out because international finance capital has the last say and international finance capital like finance capital everywhere is naturally opposed not just to a taxation heavier taxation on the rich but also to a fiscal deficit and that being the case whether you have a liberal bourgeois political government or whether you have a fascist government neo fascist political government is very little possibility of overcoming this crisis it is this difference because of which i refer to the current upsurge of fascism as neo fascism is not classical fascism is not something that is going to necessarily implode itself through a war but it is something which is therefore uh, a, a phenomenon that cannot overcome the crisis and therefore it may even it may even get voted out to the extent that democracy continues like trump was voted out but that voting out would again open the way for it to come back to power later on therefore this fascism is of a lingering kind a lingering kind that is naturally less murderous than the original fascism was and less likely to implode through a war but this fascism is the product of the neoliberal conjuncture this fascism is the ultimate kind of you know is is the ultimate realization of the neoliberal regime the ultimate expression of the neoliberal regime this fascism can be overcome only when finally overcome finally overcome i mean i'm very glad when they get voted out and so on but the threat of their return always remains they they'll be finally overcome only when we overcome the neoliberal conjuncture and overcoming the neoliberal conjuncture in the current context would mean setting in motion an alternative trajectory that of course would not immediately talk about socialism that will immediately talk about let's say providing employment providing welfare expenditures and so on but in the process of doing it 
It would necessarily mean overcoming neoliberalism. It will necessarily mean putting capital controls, putting trade controls, reviving the auto autonomy of the nation state, and therefore popular sovereignty. And this is something which, through a certain process, would lead on to socialism. Therefore, the, I, I, I see capitalism at present having reached a kind of impasse and fascism is the expression of that impasse, and that impasse can be broken only ultimately by going beyond capitalism, and this is something which we have to be aware of at the moment. Thank you very much.